Yep. Thank you. So, Docker for fun and profit. As Solomon Haig said uh, about, okay, better? Okay, so as Solomon Hikes, uh, the founder and creator of Docker Project said um, about Docker, it uses Linux containers and the internet won't shut up about it. So, but first, what's the difference between uh, containers and hypervisors? So, the hypervisor, uh, hypervisors are based on emulating virtual hardware. So, they emulate the complete hardware setup, they emulate BIOS, and they then start the OS. And every instance is completely separate. The size is measured, well, a couple of gigabytes at least. Uh, if you are using containers, the containers are based uh, sharing the operating system. So every instance shares the same kernel, the kernel of the host machine, in this case, uh, the Linux kernel. And it is uh, kind of limited that you can only run a Linux container on a Linux host. So you cannot mix uh, operating systems. As for the hypervisor, it's so you can run anything on any hypervisor, almost. So there are some limits about the drivers but uh, in theory you can. So in theory the container can share everything and almost nothing with the host. The only thing that the container has to uh, or must share with the host is the kernel. Uh, one very big um, thing about containers is its start time. So the container can start in uh, less than a second well, of course, it depends what runs in the container. If it's some Java application, it will be more than a second, always. But it's Java. And the size is measured in a couple of megabytes. And uh, you could even share uh, the libraries and executables between container. So the container could be limited to only applications. So uh, the container can be more lightweight. Uh, containers and Linux, some short history. Uh, the first uh, containerization technology in the, so that worked with Linux kernel was OpenWZ. It was open sourced in 2005, and it was the first uh, commercially successful. So uh, Parallels uh, based their business on OpenWZ as for the containers. Uh, they open sourced it, but it was out of the Linux kernel source tree which means that if you wanted to run OpenWZ, you had to first patch the Linux kernel, then compile it, or to install it from a third party uh, repository. So you couldn't use the standard Linux kernel that comes with your distribution. Uh, next, 2006 uh, process container, or, which is now called uh, C groups or control groups, were added to the kernel. Uh, 2007, Google started using C groups and it containerized search, and from that point, the complete Googleplex went uh, pretty much fully containerized. LXC was launched in 2008, so it was the version 0.10. At 2011, on Kernel Summit, they uh, managed to uh, come to an agreement, the so-called Container Unification Agreement, uh, in which so at the kernel summit, uh, Google, Parallels, and other big interested parties um, came to an agreement that only one container technology will be available in the Linux kernel, which was very good for starters. Uh, the work began on container unification at kernel, level, uh, kernel API level. C groups and namespaces uh, were agreed API, and they were included in the kernel source tree. So you could easily access them and easily compile without uh, patching the kernel. Uh, and the agreement's most important part that uh, only one underlying kernel technology for container will be used by everybody, as in OpenWZ, LXC, Docker, Zero VM, and the rest of them. In 2013, uh, the first Linux kernel that was uh, supporting So, can I continue? Yes. <laughs> uh, so in 2013, uh, the first Linux, uh, Linux kernel 
uh, came out that supported out of the box. So the OpenWZ was completely functional with the uh, kernel source tree. And it was kernel version 3.12. You didn't know, uh, need to patch the kernel to compile it to run OpenWZ. So uh, namespaces are used to isolate processes which are then used by the container or the process inside the container. C groups are used to control the resources. There are 12 C groups and six namespaces in the kernel, and the containers can use all of these or any combination. Uh, as for the security, as part of the agreement from 2011, user namespaces became the container security mechanism. Unfortunately, uh, the user namespace is isn't available in a majority of the Linux distributions, and only this year started enabling them in their stock uh, kernel that comes with the distribution. So what is Docker? Uh, Docker is a tool that uses containers to create lightweight packages for applications with instant portability. So it uses the uh, aforementioned kernel API that was agreed, and it builds upon it. So uh, Docker isn't uh, a container technology. It just uses the container technology to create its own uh, framework, so to use it as a framework. The Docker components are uh, the Docker client and server, Docker images, registries, and Docker containers. The Docker client um, communicates with the Docker daemon or server, which can be on a different machine. It can be, the Docker client can access via API remotely the Docker daemon or server, which then communicates with the lib container, which is a layer above the host OS kernel or the Linux kernel. And uh, to run Docker, uh, you need at least kernel version 3.8 and optionally enabled memory and swap accounting. If memory and swap accounting isn't enabled, uh, when you boot the kernel, then you cannot limit the memory usage and swap usage uh, by container. So the Docker images are basically read-only templates out of which Docker containers are instantiated. Uh, what it means that you have a base image on which you put a layer of file system. Uh, the base image is, for example, here um, read-only. So you put on a layer, another layer, that, uh, in which you uh, add to the container uh, different executables or data or code that you need. Uh, but it won't be saved until you commit that change and make it another permanent layer. I will explain that uh, later. Uh, so these images can either be defined by a Docker file or by committing a container, so committing the changes that you made. A Docker file is a simple file that contains instructions how to build a container. And uh, something that is also important to mention that, for example, if you have a host machine with Debian OS, so Debian version that can run uh, Docker, uh, you can inside the Docker put, for example, CentOS. So you can mix and match uh, the Linux distributions and you can use any of them inside the container. Uh, the main thing is that it has to be Linux, so one, one Linux distribution. So there are uh, something that's called a registry, Docker registry, which stores the images that have been built. So there is a very large community that uses a uh, Docker registry where you um, commit your Docker builds. There are more than 14,000 uh, ready-to-use images. Those images can contain, for example, Redis, or Memcache, or a complete Drupal, or MySQL, or PostgreSQL. So you can just download those images, make a new layer on them, and start using them. So they are so-called trusted builds. You know, where, uh, you know the source, where they come, and you can trust those uh, containers that they are clean. So uh, there are two types of registries. There's a public and a private. The public is operated by Docker Inc., the creator of Docker. 
which was uh, earlier called dot cloud and the private uh, registry so you could also register you could also make a private registry with uh, docker hub but it's limited for a free version or you can pay or uh, you could make your own private uh, docker registry which could be behind your firewall inside your infrastructure so nobody can access it uh, besides you or your developer when you need to deploy something uh, the Docker containers are launched from images and can contain uh, one or more running processes. And you can think about them as uh, the building or packing aspect of Docker, and the containers are the running or execution aspect of Docker. The Docker container is an image format, a set of standard operations, and exec execution environment. And it captures the exact configuration of a version of an application. Uh, to upgrade the application in production, the container is usually replaced with a new version, and it takes only a couple of seconds. So, for example, uh, you have your uh, workflow of uh, development, uh, so the dev version, the uh, staging version, on the production version. They could be different uh, versions of the Docker image, so the Docker container, and you could just swap them when you're ready with all the edits. You could just, as, uh, for example, as on Git, just uh, check out the whole container, and the update is finished. And when to use Docker. So if you need the version control for your whole system that on which your, uh, your app is running. So inside the container, for example, if you want to deploy your web app, Inside the container, there could be a web server, a database server, and your application. So everything is inside the container, and you could apply it, um, you, you could upgrade it and uh, make it in production as a whole. So there are no version changes. Everything is exactly as it was on your development machine. Um, on the other hand, the uh, Docker is really easy when you want to distribute uh, the same machine, so the same setup for many developers to work on. You just build your, or your system administrator builds a Docker container, uh, push it in your, for example, private repository, and all your developers can check it out and use it. So everybody's using the same setup, and there's, well, probably there won't be a problem it works on my machine because everybody has the same setup. You can use it to run uh, your code on your laptop in the same environment as on the server. And yeah, I explained the phase development. And you could also combine Docker with uh, Ansible or other configuration management system. So Ansible has its own module to control Docker. For the developers, it is build once, run anywhere. It's something that Java uh, tried to be. So Java it mainly functions like that. And configure runs, run anything for the operations. Fun with Docker. So uh, I will speak about a few uh, ideas how to use Docker and how to have fun with it. And some workflow techniques. So you could run, for example, Skype in a Docker. As we all know, Skype access many files when it's running on your computer. If, it's, if it should or shouldn't, well, that's for somebody else to decide currently. But you can run it in a container. So uh, completely isolated from your operating system, from your host machine. For example, if you don't want to set up the whole multi-arch uh, environment, you just uh, download the Docker file, which has all the instructions how to build uh, the Docker container in which uh, will the Skype be started. Uh, Skype will communicate with your host machine uh, for the sound via Pulse Audio Server, and you can forward the output of Skype uh, via SSH. The same way you could, uh, for example, make a Docker container for a Dropbox, for BitTorrent Syncs, or you could use it to uh, contain your web browser. 
So one scenario, if uh, you're a web developer and you want to test your application on multi versions of Firefox or Chrome, you could easily set up a couple of containers with uh, different versions of uh, web browser. And it only takes a couple of seconds to uh, start the container and to access the web browser. Uh, the Docker Streisand. So uh, the bottom there is a small trivia what's the Streisand effect. Uh, there is a Streisand project uh, which was um, which created Ansible playbooks that set up a whole server which runs uh, IPsec, OpenSSH, OpenVPN, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, a lot of security tools. You could use a Docker um, file to build it, uh, to build that server with all the all these services and it's uh, made in that way that you could run it for example on Amazon instance on uh, DigitalOcean um, every major cloud um, cloud provider is officially supporting Docker so the Google Compute Engine the Amazon also Microsoft Azure is supporting officially Uh, Docker shell, which is also very interesting. So uh, every time someone logs on your machine or some server, a new Docker instance is started. So every user is completely cut off. Uh, it has its own privacy. And this setup is interesting that um, if you would, for example, run uh, before all Docker instances, Every Docker instance would be uh, behind net if it didn't have its uh, own uh, public IP. Or you could uh, have to run the SSH server on different ports. If you use Docker shell, they're all behind port 22, the standard SSH port. Only uh, when the user logs in, the Docker, uh, Docker image is uh, started. Uh, Panamax is a very interesting project. It's, um, it enables uh, you to use a simple web interface. It combines uh, Vagrant and CoreOS to run uh, Docker images and you could uh, make a, a rather complex um, environments with Docker. So multiple Docker, you could run multiple Docker images. For example, in a few simple clicks, uh, you can run a, an instance, a Docker instance that will uh, run a memcache, uh, some kind of database server connected with the Apache or, for example, Nginx with a different instance for uh, PHP FPM and run your application, your web application on it. And it is easily um, started. All the containers will be connected and linked and avail, uh, available to connect from those uh, th from that setup. Uh, CoreOS is a Linux distribution, which is um, completely set up only for running Docker, only for running containers, and it's um, it's architected that way that it uses you could use it to um, deploy on multiple servers. And it has a really interesting way of upgrading its software. So you have two instances of uh, CoreOS, complete CoreOS. The one that's running is read-only. Uh, the other part is uh, only writable. So, so writable. When you update, they just switch. And if something bad happens, you can just switch back. So there are a couple of workflows that you could use with, uh, for working with uh, Docker images, so Docker containers. Uh, for example, you could develop inside a single running container as you would in a single virtual machine. So you could put every service that you need inside one uh, Docker container and work on it. So uh, there's a base image, which is uh, based on uh, Ubuntu 14.04 and you could add everything that you need on it and commit it to have uh, that container which is edited by you. 
because every time you uh, restart the container, all your changes are lost if you do not commit that, those changes, though, uh, that uh, file system level that you created. The second one is the preferred workflow, as it leverages containers and modulars. Each service that you need, uh, you could run in a separate container and then just link them. And you need to embrace user reusability of Docker files. So uh, if you are making your own Docker files, uh, you should write your general requirements early, commit, and name relevant checkpoint, and leave com customizations last. So if you have a uh, workflow, what do you need? What are your general needs? You should write it them first, commit that um, Docker file, and then uh, add on a different branch or something what you need for a different project. Uh, there's also the so-called add uh, plus build routine. When you add uh, the instructions, so with the docker add command, you can copy, for example, the source from your host machine inside the docker container, and then you could just commit. And that's a new version of your application. So new version of a container that uh, is fully running with exact versions of uh, the services and your application. Questions? Yes? <laughs> yes? Uh, what about the files that you upload? How, how, what's the best practice to let's start about it? Yes? Uh, for example, let's say you, you're making a Facebook and I'm uploading some image. Uh, where do you store it? On a host, uh, on a container, and how do you manage it? Uh, there are several techniques for that. Uh, one technique is to use, for example, NFS or to, um, uh, to, storage, uh, to use as external storage. So uh, any, any files, any data that you don't want to commit with the Docker container, you have to store it outside the container and access it from, uh, from the container. So you make it available for the services that run inside the container. The other one, which is uh, rather popular to use a uh, data container. So use one container that has access to all your data on your file system, on your host file system, and to use that container as a proxy or router or something like that, in that uh, sense, to all the other Docker containers, which will be then um, accessing the files. Actually, something like a CDN. Yes. Something like that. Uh, question? Yeah. Um, you were saying something about layering of the file system, uh, the union file system. Yes, union file system. Any idea what kind of union file system they use? Uh, BTRF. BTRFS. So ButterFS. And then immediately after that, the question is uh, what if you have two layers that both, for instance, need to add a user to the password file? Um, how do they deal with that? Because if you first make one layer mm -hmm. that does it on the password file, and then you add another layer to the password file, that works only as long as you don't take the first layer out. Well, you can't take the first layer out because they're dependent. So you only commit That's the diff. The problem. Well, yes. But on the other hand, uh, the Docker containers can share the, um, the file system. So for example, if you create from a base image many, many Docker instances, uh, they would share those, uh, those file levels until that level that you add something that's different from the base image. Exactly, but if two um, top layer or two sub layers need to change the same file, you can get nasty situations if you want to exchange one of those layers or want to take it out or reuse it in another place. You get well, a dependency. Yes, but yes, you have a dependency. A in general. But, yes. Um, something that popped in my head when I saw that so, they use union and that's really different. Yes, so you mean on this part? Yeah. It could pop yes, problems. it could. It could, but yeah, the images are dependent. So every layer is dependent on the, okay. the one. In the manifest file that's declared as such. Yes, ah, okay. yes, and so. Okay. Yeah, every, every layer has its own hash and it's dependent. 
Uh, any more questions? Yes? Uh, I have three questions. Yes? Uh, is there any maximum number of containers? No. Can I answer? More than 20,000 is impossible for yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we do have a, a limit because uh, all the containers share the uh, same resource. Same resource, and you have, for example, maximum open files. Well, that's, that's not what? the problem. The problem is the memory and also the scheduler. The scheduler cannot schedule more than 20,000 containers. I have personally yeah. tested it on the machine with enough RAM. Listen to him. <laughs> so you have your answer. Yes, uh, less than 20,000 can be scheduled, but are not running very well. Uh, on our infrastructure, we have tested up to 2,000 on the same machine working perfectly, mm -hmm. with uh, around, uh, I think, 30,000 uh, process running simultaneously on the same machine. Okay. okay. Second question is, you said that every single user is in isolated environment. Uh, yes, if you uh, it, use... Yes. Yep. Uh, it, is it possible to exploit that, to, to gain, uh, to uh, allow user, uh, let's say, privilege escalation, some kind of, to, to, get, uh, to allow user to gain access to the bottom layers? To the host machine. To the host machine yeah. So to ex escape from the container. Yeah. Well, theoretically, it is possible. And that part is still under development. So that's why um, you should use the user namespace, which should deal with that. On the other hand, uh, there are some projects that deal with this kind of security issue via uh, SE Linux. By SE Linux. So security in chance. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It takes about few seconds. Yes. What about what if you in that in that case what's going to happen if you have a user login? Well, uh, the user will probably yes, yes, because uh, when the user logs in, there are some temporary files which will be lost because the Docker uh, container will re be will be restarted. So everything that's not committed will be lost. Yes. Well, if it's inside, yes. Okay. Yes, that's why you have to use external storage for containers, for uh, SQLs, okay. SQL Server. Then you can't use Docker. <laughs> so. Yeah, but uh, almost every distribution has it. Every modern distribution has it. Yes? No. No, you use the same kernel for every, every Docker. Um, yeah. And another answer for your question about security, CoreOS has that um, security issue uh, kind of circumvented with the read-only file system. Uh, yes? So, so if, if during the running of the one container, if the host system loads another kernel module, it's reflected to, to all other containers? It's one kernel. It's the same kernel. Yes? And in extension to that, it's also possible that a, uh, a Docker is actually loading a um, malicious kernel module that will give. No. Okay. no, no, it's it's limited. It's limited, so you can. So more more kernel is disallowed. Uh, yes. If anyone is interested about uh, container security, <laughs> and have all the ones. Yes? Uh, you said that there is a core OS. Uh, what's yes. the advantage of it? I know it has some discovery, but what's the advantage? The advantage of core OS is that it's, uh, specific, uh, it's 
specially built for running uh, containers, Docker containers. So it's everything else is dropped off. So it's you could use it only for that. Uh, yes, there are some um, tools to manage um, multiple deployments. And, well, you could easily use it with Panamax. Or you could try to uh, install it on um, full metal, so bare metal, or you could run it in a vagrant. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, and also, uh, which is very interesting about the container, that they could uh, be scaled very uh, easily, horizontally and vertically. So you can uh, very easily add um, RAM or add uh, storage to them, and also um, to extract RAM, so free uh, RAM from them. And you could easily uh, multiply the instances that are running, because you have the committed uh, image, which you could just copy anywhere else and just run them. Uh, sorry, yes? you said that you can subtract RAM from Yes, the easier than from the virtual machine. And it's not very easy to do that without breaking the container itself. Because yep. the out of memory uh, manager will trigger if you subtract even a megabyte more than uh, it's required for the running system. Yes. And it will kill whatever random process it decides. Yes, but uh, for example, compared to a virtual machine, a full-blown virtual machine, it's very hard to empty uh, the RAM that it's not using and to subtract it. Uh, from the Docker, it's easier, so you can control uh, how much RAM does the process inside the container needs and to subtract till that. Yes. Mm, not yet, as, as far as I know, not yet, but they are working on it. And it should be much uh, faster than the filling up the balloon and waiting. So, the is a uh, thick provision, and you can't, uh, for example, allocate virtual RAM and, and, and get it free into it. It's not usually a process. If it's not used by a process, you could extract. So you could. Uh, but, but before that, it's, it's fixed for, for this container. Yes, yes, you could limit the amount of RAM per container. No, it's not, um, it's not allocated. Mm -hmm. You can use banks up to. Up yes. So it can be used for other things. Well, as if you think. It's a different situation. Yeah. You either. Uh, give a particular memory bank as exclusive to a container, or it's shared across all of the containers, and then you limit the amount of memory that all of these processes can take up from the whole machine. So for both thin and thick version? It depends how you want to do it. Well, if you think about uh, overcommitting your resources, that is possible to add uh, to the containers uh, more resource than you physically have. But when the processes inside the container start using all that resources, then you have to be very creative. <laughs> yes. Any more questions? Yes? Can you try migrating a Docker container from one machine to another machine with crew? Uh, no, not yet, because there didn't uh, so it says on their website it's not yet stable so they're working i think they're working with openvz because they are financed partially by parallels and parallels technologies openvz so i assume that it will first start working with openvz and then with the rest of the containers yes more questions nope then thank you